I want to welcome you to our special town hall. This is called Harvey Appreciation and V2C2 Anticipation. We um, have a departure from what has become our annual town hall meeting. And um, when I got contacted by the president's office asking if one of these dates in October worked, I said, oh no, we're not doing it until February. And they said, oh yes, we are doing it now. So. <laughs> So uh, we've had a whole lot going on. Can you believe it's been just six short weeks since we had that um, eclipse and how much of life has happened in that time and we've all been impacted directly or indirectly by the events of the past six weeks. Harvey is you know, most present to us but um, there's been a lot else going on. So um, President Lebron has um, some things to say about that, as well as um, what we're doing moving forward with the new phase of our strategic plan. So um, I'd like to thank him for taking the time to um, come out and meet with us and share his thoughts. Um, he will take questions at the end, so please have those in mind and we'll pass a mic around um, so we can capture those. And so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome President Lebron. Well, good, good morning. That was pretty good for a first try. Uh, anyways, Marie said, I, I want to try to do two, three things this morning. Uh, first, talk a little bit about Harvey. I mean, I have to say, uh, you know, uh, thinking back, I haven't begun a fall like this fall in many ways since 2001. If you, if you look at the string of events, three extraordinary hurricanes, earthquakes in Mexico, and now this incredibly sad, unbelievable shooting in Las Vegas, that's just an extraordinarily not good way to begin a fall. There are a lot of people still suffering, even as, even as we look around our campus and have fully recovered, there are many folks in our own community whose homes have been devastated, who are trying to still figure out how to, how to recover from this. And of course, people in Florida and Puerto Rico and across Mexico and now in Las Vegas. And I think all of those folks um, deserve our concern, indeed our, our concern for our city and our country and the world at, at large. And that's part of what I think we need to do as a university, that, that whatever goes on out there in that world is something that deserves our attention. We don't live in a bubble in terms of our own folks, and we don't live in a bubble insofar as the world is concerned. Um, as Marie indicated, I want to do three kind of things. I want to talk a little bit about the response to Harvey. Um, fairly unwelcome visitor on our campus. Uh, I want to talk just very briefly about a couple sort of state of the university things, just a couple interesting statistics. And then I hope I'm going to spend most of the time before I get the hook. And I, don't worry, there is somebody out there whose job is to give me the hook. Um, uh, but that's really the, probably the main thing I'd like to do today. So I think, as Marie said, we began classes kind of in an ordinary year. Um, we had an eclipse. Um, the nice thing about an eclipse is kind of nobody denies the science behind the eclipse, right? <laughs> we predict the eclipse. The eclipse comes. People were very excited. I was so disappointed not to be able to travel to the zone of totality. Uh, just a little personal fact. The first time in my life I had significant amount of money to spend um, not hugely significant, but as a 13-year-old, it was pretty significant. The one thing I did was go out and buy the biggest telescope that I could afford. And so not to see the totality, but still it was exciting on this campus. The students were very excited. People were out in, um, uh, in, in the, in the uh, academic quad looking at the eclipse. That seemed to be a great natural way to begin the um, year and then uh, less than, uh, or about a week later, I guess less than, I'm sorry, less than a week later, uh, we had another natural phenomenon that had a, a set of consequences, perhaps exacerbated by not natural things, but things that, that we had done as a city here in Houston. 
So here in Rice, I think what, what kind of make us proud is we, we talk about our culture of care, we talk about our sense of being a community, and I think we really saw that in action. What I've sort of uh, said to folks on a few occasions that for me, I, I judge our response by, by three criteria. Uh, the intelligence uh, at which we think through the problems that we confront, the competence uh, that we have in executing our response, and the compassion that we show to people who are, are injured or badly affected in, in some way. And I think on all of those, we have a lot to be proud uh, of our community in terms of its response. Uh, this was managed by a crisis management team uh, led by uh, Kevin Kirby, Jerusha Akash, and Marilyn Miranda, really uh, structuring a, a very broad-ranging response to the events on this campus. But I think the point of this slide is th the range of people who participated in that response, who stepped up all across the campus, thinking through every issue, every kind of person who might have been affected, what are the services that we need on campus, uh, how do we approach that? What can we learn from the people immediately who may be affected? Uh, it was really extraordinary. Uh, particular shout out and thanks to, to the ride out team. Those were the folks who really stayed on the campus, many of whom sort of went home right before the hurricane and had a little bit of time with their families. And then it's hard during a crisis like that to be separated from your family. But they were on this campus taking care of everything that needed to be taken care of, whether it was feeding our students, making sure our cars uh, got moved and were, were safe in the new garage, uh, all kinds of things that occurred to protect people in anticipation of the storm, during the storm, and its immediate aftermath. And our students really stepped up. And they volunteered to do things on our campus when they need to be done. Unlike prior, uh, you know, I was here for Ike. How many, how many folks were here for Ike? Yeah. So this was a different kind of storm. But in Ike, we had a couple little problems with the students, you know, the students who thought it'd be cool to keep Valhalla operating during a hurricane. <laughs> the students who thought a good place to watch a hurricane was the top of Sid Rich, right? <laughs> These were not good ideas. The only problem we had during this hurricane was that our students wanted to leave the campus to volunteer before we wanted them to leave the campus. It's hard to complain about that too much, I have to say. They really stepped up. Uh, the Rice Harvey Action Team, uh, managed by the uh, Center for Civic Leadership and the Door Institute for New Leaders, they really matched people together with their needs, who went out, helped people remove debris from their homes, provide whatever other assistance they might. Uh, faculty, staff, all pitched in, again, on our campus, for folks in our community and for others across the city of Houston. Even our faculty stepped up. It's, uh, it's not ideal to leave a large number of 18 to 22 year olds unoccupied for an extended period of time. And so the question was, what can we do? Of course, the folks in the rec center, in the library, all stepped up, as did some of our faculty, in trying to find things to engage our students actively. Uh, so what are we going to do going forward? The, the Rice Harvey Action Team is still uh, trying to provide volunteer assistance to folks who need it throughout the city, an opportunity for students and others to continue to donate their time. As previously announced, the university has allocated $500,000 for research efforts that might help the city in its recovery in both the short and the long term available to both students, faculty, and, st and, st and staff with ideas. Uh, after uh, the important work that, that I get to do is to work on acronyms. And so we have <laughs> finally came up with RICE HERE, the Houston Engagement and Recovery uh, effort. And we're in the process of more publicly announcing that, setting forth the criteria. And we already have a huge number of faculty and others across the campus who are engaged with the city. The city really sees us in many ways as their go-to resource when they are thinking through the problems the city faces, whether it's in education or storm resilience, um, healthcare, a lot of issues. And those are some uh, illustrations of some of the projects already being worked on. 
And then, of course, we have programs to help our employees and our students, some grants we have, just to provide a little bit of extra assistance as folks face the challenges ahead. And then I wanted to put in a little pitch. We're starting our United Way campaign, and I know many of you already donated, as we have, to the, to the, to the hurricane efforts, and we thank you for that. But there are a lot of needs in the city apart from the hurricane. And we're known as a community, as an institution, as a university that contributes to the city beyond our size in, in every respect. And so this is another opportunity to help those, not just those affected by the hurricane, but those who have needs that existed before the hurricane and will continue to exist after the hurricane. So briefly, just a couple things about the university. I want to focus a little bit on our, on our student body and our group of staff as well. So this gives you a picture over from 2004 before the vision for the second century, our, our sort of prior strategic plan. And you see what a, a dramatic change both in the number of applicants and where they're geographically distributed from. Increased more than twice. A nice 50% increase in applicants from Texas but a more than 100% increase in applications from the US outside Texas, and an eight-fold increase, almost eight-fold increase in um, international applications. So the applicant pool is a good indication of what our footprint is. Where are we known across the country and the world? And that has dramatically changed. We've also become one of the most diverse institutions in the country, certainly like us. Again, a sense of how things have changed from the fall of 2004 to 2017. Uh, no majority in our undergraduate uh, student body. It's an incredibly vibrant diversity from 3% international to 12% uh, international, roughly, in the student body. Uh, for those of us who have that daily contact with our student body, I think it's incredibly exciting. At the same time, we want to emphasize, that was the undergraduate student body, how important the graduate student body is to us. Having a graduate student body and an excellent graduate student body is what defines us as a university and not a college. And you'll see, we become not quite 50-50, although the number of entering graduate students and the number of uh, entering freshmen this year was almost precisely the same, that we were within one student, it was like 1,000. 47, and I can't remember which was 1,047 and which was 1,048. If you compared us to the Ivy League, for example, range the eight schools of the Ivy League in terms of percentage graduate students, we would be exactly in the middle of that. And so we become a very different university. It's important that we pay close attention to that. And you can see fairly dramatic growth over the last 12 years or so in almost every aspect of the program, um, uh, about a 25% increase in doctoral students, but then a very dramatic growth in professional master's students. Again, we are a much more robust university, providing a much broader range of opportunity for students. And not just, of course, in degree programs, but also in non-degree programs, for example, through the Glasscock School. This is our MOOC enrollment. Now you'll see it hits a peak of 530,000 or so, seems to decline. But a lot of what's going on is not so much decline as focus. The, the MOOC, the 20, 2011, for some of you who remember back then, was the year of the MOOC. It turned out that uh, free turns out um, not to be an ideal business model. And uh, that, that was a great surprise to many folks. And, and so what we see in the organizations that we participate, more focus on learners who are investing in their education and completing their education, whereas the earlier statistics are mostly about students who at least you know, dip their toe in the, in the water, was kind of having to like, register for a course in order to get the syllabus. And so it's a changing group of students. But we've had contact over these years with something like 2 million so students, so that's again a very different picture when you have one course that enrolls as many students as we have graduated in the entire history of Rice University, it tells you something about the changing opportunities that lie before us. This is a sense of growth of the faculty. 
fairly modest growth, about 9% uh, growth of the, of the tenure and tenure track faculty during this time, more substantial growth of non-tenure track uh, faculty, although those, those tended to be in a few areas in language instruction and in writing instruction, uh, particularly in the School of Social Sciences. Uh, but overall, some significant growth of our, our faculty. So this, I thought, was uh, interesting, and you know, particularly in light of some of the, the policies that, that we see adopted or told might be adopted and on these issues. Rice uh, has taken very strong positions. Uh, in our staff, about 82% are, are US citizens, and 18% are um, inter international in some sense, many permanent residents. That compares to 22% in the faculty. So we are an extraordinarily international community. That doesn't count those who have become American citizens. So we have this robust international aspect in every part of our campus, students, faculty, and staff. Uh, and this is just going back to a kind of comparison. Our staff, like our student body, is incredibly diverse. Um, the, the staff comes much closer to the verse, diversity of the student body, of course, than our faculty does. And we have to continue to work on that and to make sure that our, that our staff is diverse in every part of the university um, and every level of responsibility. I wanted to just say a, a word about careers at Rice, a new program that we're about to, to turn out. It's really important that not only do we recruit great staff, but we also retain great staff, and we give them opportunities to advance their careers. And, and Mary Cronin and her folks have been putting a lot of attention into thinking, what a, not just what a job at Rice should look like, but what a career at Rice should look like. And so I would sort of urge you to look forward to that and pay attention to that as we roll out the details. And here's just one other indication of our health as a university in terms of the growth of our sponsored research has doubled or so over the last 13 years. But in terms of almost every measure, um, whether you look um, at our endowment and the endowment performance, our tuition revenues, uh, the university is an extraordinarily strong financial position. We're one of eight or nine universities that has a, a AAA bond rating. Uh, and some indication we're in a great position to move forward. Capital projects, of course, the Moody Center uh, for the Arts uh, was opened and under the leadership of Allison Weaver is off to an incredibly uh, vibrant start. If you haven't been over there, there's a great uh, art exhibit there now, the Brian Patterson Sports Performance Center, uh, long, long awaited soccer and track facilities and especially for our women athletes, I remember too long ago making a promise to, to um, some of our women athletes that we would build this facility. If you haven't seen it, it's worth seeing. It's exactly the right facility. And the Allen Center parking uh, and office building, teaching lab renovations. Uh, so it's sort of much been underway. And then uh, moving forward, uh, all more or less already under construction, at least to the extent that you've probably noticed you've lost some parking. Uh, is the Rice Music uh, and Performing Arts Center, space science renovation, a new clean room. The clean room is just the kind of facility that we need not only to attract and retain our own scientists, but to bring other scientists to Rice who can work with our scientists. And then, of course, the exciting projects of utilities infrastructure. I, I sort of troll in every audience I speak to. Uh, if you know somebody who would like to put their name on utility infrastructure, uh, please, please contact me or Dara Zeidenstein as soon as you can. Uh, some projects in Reckling Park. Uh, planning underway, as it has been, but now uh, with much more force and a new gift behind it. Uh, social Sciences Building, a multicultural center, uh, Discovery Kitchen in the BRC and, and Mech Lab. A word about the new office and, and parking building. Of course, those sort of roughly 500 new spaces turned out to be useful in the hurricane as we were able to get the city with record speed to give us a temporary certificate of occupancy. It's kind of nice to know when you've got a hurricane bearing down on you, you can get some quick, quick action. If it, unfortunately, the information today is too good, so you can't just sort of make up a hurricane threat in order to, to do that on a regular basis. But again, we thank the city for 
for doing that. This building, this facility, the parking, of course, we very much uh, needed in the center of the campus. We didn't have enough. But building this building <clears throat> enables us to move back. They were going to be evict evicted anyway, the, the staff we had in Memorial, uh, the Memorial Hermann Tower. So they now have a great, great place, the um, uh, human resources and others. And then to vacate the building on the Green proper, Greenbrier property, which was kind of a, a sad, small, old building sitting in the middle of, uh, not that the people in it there were sad. Um, <laughs> Um, sitting in the middle of a very large and valuable piece of property. And so one of the opportunities we face moving forward is how should we make use of that and other properties that Rice has uh, off campus. Uh, and we have some new leaders here, uh, our new vice president for enrollment, Ivan Romero da Silva, who we recruited from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Reggie de Roche, who we recruited from uh, Georgia Tech, and Kathleen Canning from the University of Michigan, who will be arriving in January. Uh, it's also been a good year. I don't like to overemphasize rankings. Uh, most of them are, are terribly flawed. Uh, there are a few that are more accurate. Uh, Niche.com uh, is one of the ones that's more accurate, just uh, for reference. That, that's the one right here, uh, that, that, that one. Um, US News uh, has a lot to learn. Uh, but, this was a good year for us. Those are flawed, but the, I think the important point for us is how consistently well we are doing, not just in these overall rankings, but actually on things that are important, on the quality and commitment to teaching on our campus, in terms of the interaction among students from different uh, socioeconomic, racial, and ethnic uh, backgrounds, in terms of the um, quality of life, our number one ranking from Princeton Review uh, on the best quality of, of life. Uh, we did fall to number two on happiest students. Uh, that's not entirely a bad thing. I remember the conversation I had a number of years ago with a student who'd been on the campus two weeks, and I was trying to convince that they should take advantage of an opportunity to study abroad, and their response was, no, they weren't going to do that because they were just too happy here at Rice. Um, I told the board we needed to rethink the happiness thing just a little bit. Uh, but all of you folks at our faculty serve our students incredibly well. So moving on to uh, our strategic plan, vision for the, the second century, part two, or second decade, V2C2. Uh, and we are releasing uh, to the uh, campus today, but behind password, and you might say, well, why are you releasing your strategic plan behind a password? You should have access to that at about 1 o'clock or so later today. And the answer is, this is a draft plan. And it's hard to have a draft plan if you publish it to the entire world. It becomes your, your public plan. And so we're just making that available to the Rice community so we can gather comments and input and make significant revisions to that plan. And that's what we're expecting to do. In its present form, it has seven strategic goals that I'll go through, 36 objectives, which some of which I'll put briefly on the screen, and hundreds of action, which I'm going to go through in great detail over the next two. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, so just a brief recap, some, for those of you who might not have been here, some of the accomplishments of the vision for the second century. Certainly have a larger, more diverse, highly qualified student body, as you've seen this, a much bigger research profile, capital investments in research and other places, much more uh, robust curriculum, as particularly international, writing, some of those other things, increased visibility, um, and much greater engagement with the city. We just don't hear anymore from the city that you know, Rice sits behind its hedges. Rice has never been more engaged than it is now with the city of Houston. So in formulating this draft plan, we went through a process, uh, some involved le from leadership across the campus and formulating an initial set of questions. We took those questions out to the community, got a lot of feedback, reconvened leadership from across the university to have discussions about the ideas and the feedback, and formulated this document, early drafts, which have been discussed uh, and, and edited. And you might, sometimes you might read it and think, boy, it looks like 100 different people wrote this document. And the answer is, yes, 100 different people helped 
write this document in some form. We hope it's beginning to have a single voice to it as it evolves. So I want to go through pretty quickly the seven major goals. I don't know that any of these will be particularly surprising. A lot of the, the meat, so, so to speak, of the plan is in the, the details for it. Not surprisingly, you know, one of our top goals is really to uh, really having a transformative undergraduate education for our students. And the, the number one thing that emerged from students and faculty was we need greater engagement of students and faculty, a greater role for faculty in the lives of the students. And that's not easy, considering both how busy our faculty is and how busy our students are. Uh, our students are expecting more innovative opportunities, experiential opportunities. And then they, of course, need the facilities. And we've started talking about uh, what we're calling Central Quad 4.0 which is the next evolution of this space, including a substantial renovation of, of this building, the RMC, a renovation of the library, and then perhaps over there, a new flexible classroom tower, which will continue to position the library and the central quad as the intellectual and vibrant heart of our campus. What we expect is that we will have the best undergraduate education available, fueled by that engagement. And then we must build internationally preeminent uh, graduate and PhD programs. That starts with recruiting the best possible students, identifying them, not being passive about that, but really going after the best students, strategically raising the quality of the programs that, that have, at least in the next few years, the, next, the most promise to achieve international preeminence. And then just as with our undergraduates, our graduate students also expect a strong sense of community. Valhalla, I don't know if I want to be quoted on this. <laughs> Valhalla is great, <laughs> except when they open during a hurricane. Uh, but we need more for our graduate students to enable them also to have a strong sense of community on our campus. We want this to be a destination for graduate students who come first and foremost because of the quality, the academic quality of the programs and the research opportunities. But if we promise them also a great experience, this will be their destination of choice. Uh, we've been very successful in some parts of our, our efforts at diversity. We must continue that. We must focus particularly on lower income students, not only in attracting those students, but also making sure that we have the programs as we do now with uh, the Rice Emerging Scholars Program, that we can provide them the additional resources, not just to succeed at Rice, but to, for them to succeed in realizing their ambitions in coming to Rice. Every kind of opportunity we offer, whether it's international travel or internships, we have to make sure that all of our students have that opportunity. And the challenge of affording our education is not unfortunately just one for lower income students, which actually we meet pretty well, but increasingly for middle income students and upper middle income students. And we have to figure out how to address uh, that as well. And of course, the diversity and inclusiveness doesn't just stop with our student body, but extends to our faculty and our staff to create an environment that all feel is welcoming to our students. We must build the faculty strategically. We can't so to build in everything simultaneously. Uh, because we're small, we need to promote collaboration across the faculty. And I think uh, we heard a lot about really wanting to make Rice an academic destination for people to come to. And that means that we have to have the support and the facilities to do that. That doesn't necessarily mean building new facilities, but it does mean that every time we build something, we have to ask the question, how does this serve the larger campus community? For example, in the Music and Performing Arts Center, we've had discussions from the very beginning about how that facility can serve the community broadly in theater as an ideal venue when we bring distinguished speakers to the campus. There'll be no better venue than that facility, up to about 600 people for bringing uh, speakers to, the, to Rice. And we have to, as we did in the past, enhance our research achievement and reputation. We've talked about, just kind of as a discussion point to start with, prospect of doubling our research funding over the next decade. 
recognizing, of course, that research productivity across the university is not always measured by research funding. It's certainly measured in significant part in that way in science and engineering, but it's certainly not in the humanities. And there we look for other measures of research output and visibility. Increasing our postdoctoral programs is also essential to that. And then we ought to identify a few global challenges where Rice can make a very distinctive contribution. And uh, we want to continue to engage Houston. This, is, as I said, has been a very successful part of the V2C. We think we're positioned now to contribute and learn from Houston at an entirely new level, particularly with the addition of the Kinder Institute, the Baker Institute's engagement, uh, engagement in many different ways across the School of uh, Social Sciences, the School of Architecture. We have an opportunity to really help shape the future of Houston. And that ought to be what our ambition is. One of the things I like to say about Rice is that we are a small university in a big city that's treated like a big university in a small city. We have to earn that recognition every year by contributing to our city and making a real difference to it. And we have to make use of the city by making it uh, an opportunity for all of our, our students. And we need to extend Rice's reach and impact. And when we thought about that issue 12 years ago, we thought about it a lot in terms of having to expand the number of students on our campus. And we grew from about 2,900, I think, undergraduates or, or so to 3,800 undergraduates on our campus. Uh, we grew our graduate programs actually by an even greater percentage. We're now in a different age in which there are other ways to think about building our footprint, particularly digitally through a global presence, activating our alumni. But if we're to continue to succeed, we have to succeed on a global stage. And I believe we can continue to do that without necessarily significantly increasing the number of students on our campus here in Houston. Now, part of this process has not been just to build those larger planks, but to begin to search for some signature uh, efforts that we would invest in over the next uh, decade, over the next five or 10 years. And the next couple slides just have a few examples of that, uh, things that we can do with partners in the Texas Medical Center in engineering and medicine. Uh, our campus has one of the best collection of people researching materials anywhere. Uh, we have a relatively new group, uh, part of which we uh, stole uh, from uh, Southern California. I think it was a mo moment of great pride for the university uh, when a newspaper down there described us as pirates. Uh, uh, we, we took that uh, with some pride, but we have a terrific group in what's called systems synthetic and physical biology. We've already begun investing in data science, and data science requires both focus strength in areas like uh, computer science and computer engineering and statistics and computational and applied math, but it also requires strength all across the university and all of those parts of the university, and there are many, that are going to increasingly use data and large pools of data as part of their uh, research and scholarship. Emerging interest in disparities and equities, certainly an outstanding department of sociology, but not just there, all across the campus, people are interested in inequalities. How do they arise? How can they be addressed? I think one of the big issues that Houston faces is in the context of this hurricane, often at a time of crisis, it's the people who are least well off who suffer the most. It increases the inequity and disparity within the city. How can we help sort of address some of those problems? Earth energy and the environment, uh, if you're not reminded of that importance uh, by uh, three hurricanes, um, I don't know what will remind you of the importance of that. Uh, the School of Social Science, again, have developed an effort in data-driven social policy analysis. We've talked a little bit about this idea of uh, Central Quad 4.0, uh, new engagements for Houston, which may make uh, use of uh, not just the property on Greenbrier to describe, but a property next to the Bioscience Research Collaborative, 
we uh, purchased last year and some property we may acquire in the very near future. Off-campus properties that give us an opportunity to think how can we use those both to advance Houston and advance Rice and build the two of us together? Uh, how do we make a contribution to making Houston a real model city of the future? And of course, global health, particularly as exemplified by Professor Rebecca Richards Cordham, now one of four finalists for the MacArthur 100 and Change Award. Um, most people would not describe $100 million as change. Um, but it, it can certainly fuel change. And to have be the only university actually represented among those finalists, and indeed among the eight semifinalists, is truly extraordinary. So what lies ahead? So today, again, the, this uh, um, V2C2 draft will be distributed to the entire community. Over the next uh, almost three weeks, we'll be looking for online feedback. We'll be engaging in conversations across the campus for the next roughly two months uh, and present it uh, after redrafting in light of all those comments for the board for approval in the December, January timeframe. What will it take to be successful in our ambitions? Of course, we'll need a very successful fundraising effort, a capital campaign we envision, roughly speaking, for the next eight years. Haven't set a final number for that. But we're also going to have to look for ways to increase, increase revenues in other ways, perhaps through new degree programs, new online programs. We are going to have to reallocate some of our effort and resources to do new things. We may have to change some aspects of how the university is organized, and we need to build new partnerships, both internally and externally. Those are all the things we need to do to realize Lovett's original statement that in everything we set, no upper limit. And what that requires is that, is that every stage of the existence of our university, we need to raise the bar. And that's what we seek to do with a new vision for our university, to raise that bar once more to get beyond where we ever thought we'd be able to go. Thank you all very, very much.